To dig into Messianic Judaism, we first need to answer the question of who it is we are talking about. Many Messianic Jews would look like this. He believes that there is one God, as revealed in the Tanakh, which Christians commonly call the Old Testament, and also accepts the New Testament as scripture. He believes that Jesus was the promised Messiah, and believes that the one God is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now you may be saying, that sounds an awful lot like Christianity. Messianic Jews accept that Christianity is a true form of worshiping God, but are normally hesitant to call themselves Christian. The Messianic Jewish Theological Institute says, Jewish life is life in a concrete historical community. Thus, Messianic Jewish groups must be fully part of the Jewish people, sharing its history and its covenantal responsibility as a people chosen by God. At the same time, faith in Yeshua also has a crucial communal dimension. This faith unites the Messianic Jewish community and the Christian church, which is the assembly of the faithful from the nations who are joined to Israel through the Messiah. Together, the Messianic Jewish community and the Christian church constitute the Ecclesia, the one body of Messiah, a community of Jews and Gentiles who in their ongoing distinction and mutual blessing anticipate the shalom of the world to come. As you see there, the institute says that Messianic Jews are fully part of the Jewish people. However, they have faith in Yeshua, Jesus. Ron Campus, writing for the Times of Israel in 2013, explains, Messianic Jews embrace Jesus as the Messiah, but hew to Jewish traditions, observing Jewish holidays and reciting Hebrew prayers and services. Many, but by no means all, are born Jews who have come to accept Jesus and see their practices as legitimate expressions of Judaism. Mainstream Jewish groups generally have rejected Messianic Jews, seeing them as luring Jews into Christianity under the pretense that they can maintain their Judaism even while accepting belief in Jesus. In the article, Campius quotes Jewish rabbi David Wolp, It is dishonest, deliberately or inadvertently, to say that one can live in a Jewish faith community and accept another scripture or accept a different God. It's striking that for thousands of years the definition of being Christian was believing in Jesus, and all of a sudden they've discovered, no, you can do that and be Jewish. It is, whether they realize it or not, a marketing tool, not a discovery. A 2013 poll from Pew Research Center surveyed American Jews and asked, can a person be Jewish if he, she does not believe in God? 68% of Jews said yes. Another question was, can a person be Jewish if he, she believes Jesus was Messiah? And the answer to this found only 34% said yes. However, many Messianic Jews found that number to be heartening. Acceptance of themselves as Jews by 34% was considered a step up from how things have looked in the past. Notably, the survey's methodology excluded people who are Messianic Jews themselves from participating in the survey. But the majority reject Messianics as being Jews. Reuven Hammer writes in the Jerusalem Post, Are Messianic Jews Jews? If you really want to be Jews, stop deceiving yourselves and seriously consider returning to the Jewish fold. Jewish law makes a distinction between non-Jews who are Christians and born Jews who accept Christianity. Having left Judaism, the latter are Christians who are also apostate Jews. As such, Jewish law cannot grant them the privileges of Jews, such as synagogue membership, aliyot to the Torah, and Jewish burial. However, if they return to Judaism, they will be welcomed back. Unlike born Christians, a Jew who is converted from Judaism has demonstrated a negative attitude, not to say contempt, for Judaism. Judaism recognizes and honors Christians and Christianity and does not seek to convert Christians to Judaism. At the same time, it expects Christianity to respect Judaism and not to seek to convert Jews. Unfortunately, Messianic sects do exactly that while contending that they do not. The Jerusalem Post also quoted the top Israeli government official in charge of the right to return immigration for Jews to Israel in another article. He said, We work according to the law and we operate according to that. They, Messianic Jews, are not connected to the Jewish community. If someone declares that they believe in Jesus, then he is not a Jew. He does not believe in our faith. It's simple. A Jew who wants to immigrate to Israel will move to Israel if he can prove his Judaism. If he can't prove his Judaism, then it's a different story. And here's once again the Messianic Jewish viewpoint, this time from the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. Messianic Judaism is a biblically-based movement of people who, as committed Jews, believe in Yeshua, Jesus, as the Jewish Messiah of Israel, of whom the Jewish law and prophets spoke. To many, this seems a glaring contradiction. Christians are Christians. Jews are decidedly not Christian. So goes the understanding that has prevailed through nearly 2,000 years of history. Messianic Jews call this a mistaken and even anti-scriptural understanding. 
historical and biblical evidence demonstrates that following Yeshua was initially an entirely Jewish concept. Decades upon decades of persecution, division, and confused theology all contributed to the dichotomy between Jews and believers in Yeshua that many take for granted today. Beth Zion, a Messianic Jewish synagogue in New Jersey, explains why Messianic Jews are hesitant to describe themselves as Christians. For the record, we have no problem with people calling themselves Christians. We enjoy fellowship and solidarity with everyone who truly knows and loves Messiah. But we are a Jewish congregation and one with our Jewish people. We do not celebrate Christian holidays, but observe the Jewish ones from a traditional and messianic perspective. The word Christian, though a very endearing title to many, has been used in so many different ways that it simply does not effectively define who we are as Jewish followers of Messiah. Within the church world, the ambiguity of this term is underscored by how often people add a prefix, like true, real, born again, spirit-filled, and Bible-believing, to the word Christian, in an attempt to more accurately clarify what they mean. In true communication, it is important to use terms that clearly express what you honestly mean to say, rather than rely on popular catchphrases and labels that seem easier to use, but that listeners may define differently than what you think you are conveying. Terms like Christ, Christian, unsaved Jew, convert, baptized, trinity, and cross conjure up in most Jewish minds images of pogroms, inquisitions, crusades, the Holocaust, assimilation, or spiritual genocide. It often leaves our people with a distorted view of who Yeshua really is, and presents him as some sort of alien, pagan, mythological deity. These terms are not a part of our vocabulary. We are an authentic Jewish community that sets the record straight concerning the Jewish Messiah. We do not use terminology as witnessing tools, but as an honest expression of our walk with God within the framework of a genuine Jewish lifestyle. It helps define exactly who we are, and clearly articulate what we believe about Messiah. We present the message and person of Yeshua within a Torah-based model established by God and confirmed in all Yeshua taught and did. So let's be very clear. Most Jews reject that Messianic Jews are truly Jews. Messianic Jews claim that they are Jews. This is the controversy. One major line of reasoning given by Messianic Jews is that while Jesus was on earth, he and his disciples were Jews. There was not a new religion, but rather a particular Messianic stripe within Judaism. Some Messianic Jews present that perhaps the split between Judaism and Christianity should never have been absolute, or at least that it did become so shouldn't mean that we can't go back to the first century ideal. David Rudolph in the book Introduction to Messianic Judaism says, there was never a single event by that name, the Jewish Christian schism. After it had conclusively taken place, it seemed to everyone to be utterly natural that it should have come to pass. Yet there was a space of at least 50 years, twice that in most respects, during which it had not happened, was not inevitable or clearly probable, and was not chosen by everyone, not even by everyone who finally was going to have to accept it. Rudolph then goes on to say, the circle church and the circle Jewry overlapped for generations in the persons who we may call either Messianic Jews or Jewish Christians, who, for over a century at least, stood in fellowship with both wider circles. They were not split apart from one another by Jesus being honored as Messiah, nor by anyone's keeping nor not keeping the law. The split, which was ultimately to push the circles apart, began, we saw, not in the first century, but in the second. Rudolph also makes the claim that Christianity should maintain a distinct group of Jewish believers, as opposed to everyone assimilating into a Gentile Christianity. He quotes George Howard, where in the book Paul, A Crisis in Galatia, he says, The gospel as Paul preached it demanded a continued ethnic distinctiveness between Jews and Gentiles in order that Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, could be conceptualized by both Jews and Gentiles as the God of all nations. This is certainly his point of view in Romans 3, 29 through 30, where he says, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one. His thought is, if God is one, he must be the God of both Jews and Gentiles. We may even go further and say that any attempt on either side to erase the ethnic and cultural nature of the other would be to destroy Paul's particular concept of unity between Jews and Gentiles. In some ways, Messianic Judaism challenges the assumed meaning of what it means to be a Jew and what it means to be a Christian. The latter is seen in how Messianic Judaism can come under fire from the Christian side for being too Jewish. Craig Keener writes in a chapter of the same book, When Gentile churches today criticize Jewish believers in Jesus for Jewish dancing or abstaining from pork or other elements of their heritage and culture, Gentile churches impose their own culture as the norm. 
This prejudice differs little from Paul's rivals in Galatia who wanted to impose traditional Jewish customs on Gentiles. The parallel simply reveals how deep is the challenge of syncretism, of mixing our own cultural values with the gospel and assuming that the mixture represents the gospel. Contextualizing our faith in cultural forms is good. Making this contextualization the standard for all cultures represents a fatal misunderstanding of the gospel. Another theological consideration is the question of how Messianic Judaism's view of the Old Testament law meshes with the theological frameworks of Christian denominations. In other words, how their claims are compatible or incompatible with the views of Catholics or Reformed and so on. And at least for those two groups, there are certainly some tensions to be worked out. In Introduction to Messianic Judaism, Todd Wilson presents his argumentation for the claim that Paul emphasizes in Galatians not so much the supersession or superfluity of the law with the coming of Christ and the advent of the Spirit, but the suspension of the law's curse. Wilson recognizes the challenges this view faces in light of certain established theological points of view. This reading of Galatians has, of course, potentially far-reaching implications for how Galatians contributes to discussions about Christian supersessionism, the idea that the church has displaced the Jews as the elect people of God. For the superfluity of the law is closely related to supersessionist eschatology. Telling, for example, is F.F. F. Bruce's interpretive paraphrase of 518, with the coming of Christ and the completion of his redeeming work, the age of the law has been superseded by the age of the Spirit. H.D. Betts is also particularly clear on this point. If the validity of the Jewish Torah ends for the Jew when he becomes a Christian, there is no point or basis for Gentiles as well as for Jews to adhere to the Jewish religion. In other words, the superfluity of the law is a corollary of the supersession of the Jews within God's redemptive purposes. What is more, some advocates of the new perspective have only reinforced this basic assumption by reading the argument of Galatians 5.13 through 6.10 and often the rest of the letter in the following terms. This is what Paul finds wrong with the law of Moses. It is not the spirit. In other words, the law is not a problem per se, it is simply superseded by the dawning of the spirit. Messianic Judaism has many varieties. Even the description I gave at the beginning doesn't fit everyone. Some are Unitarian, rejecting the Trinity and saying that although Jesus was the Messiah, he isn't God. The amount of observance of the Torah, often known by Christians as the Mosaic Law, also varies. Observance of dietary laws, too, can vary. With the recognition that these other groups do exist, we're going to take a look at what is generally considered the mainstream of Messianic Judaism. Messianic Jews generally have a synagogue as opposed to a church and worship on the seventh day Sabbath as opposed to the first day of the week. Introduction to Messianic Judaism says that Messianic worship is normally more upbeat than a regular synagogue service, that it contains song, dance, and instrumental music and prayer book liturgy. It is also clarified that some synagogues are more traditional. All the traditional Jewish festivals are celebrated and infant boys are circumcised on the eighth day. Bar mitzvah celebrations are held for boys when they turn 13 and bat mitzvah for girls at 12 or 13, and weddings and funerals have many traditional Jewish elements. In Introduction to Messianic Judaism, it is pointed out that Messianic Jewish synagogues are an attractive option for intermarried Jew-Gentile couples. It is stated that intermarriage tends to blur the traditional boundaries between Judaism and Christianity within the average family so that a quasi-Messianic Jewish religious expression naturally arises. Intermarried couples find common ground in Messianic synagogues. Many Messianic Jewish congregations are affiliated with either the International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues, IAMCS, founded in 1986, through the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, or MJAA, and which has 155 congregations as of 2021, and the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, which claims over 75 congregations and has 67 locations listed on its website. The MJAA has formerly used the name Hebrew Christian Alliance of America, but changed to the current name in 1975. Introduction to Messianic Judaism says, Those involved with Messianic Jewish national organizations generally believe that some level of Torah observance is either commanded by God or should be encouraged of Messianic Jews. To be a part of the International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues and the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, member congregations must meet on the Sabbath, celebrate the Jewish holidays, and worship in a way that incorporates Jewish religious tradition in one way or another. 
A question that might be asked is what the differences are between these two groups themselves. That doesn't seem to be an easy one to answer. In her answer, competing trends in Messianic Judaism, the debate over evangelicalism, the late Gabriella Rizan refers to the MJAA, including IAMCS, and the UMJC as the two main Messianic Jewish organizations. She says, among other things, that the UMJC is more disposed to theological reflection than the Alliance, and then makes a contrast between MJAA and IAMCS congregations as not on the whole, but generally viewing Jewish ritual observances as more a personal choice, while UMJC congregations are more likely to view them as obligations. She says of the IAMCS, Beth Yeshua, like many in the Alliance, exhibits a suspicion of tradition when it is based on rote ritual without emphasis on the person's heart attitude, which is the way they perceive most traditional observant Jews. Implicit in this view is an evangelical fear of legalism, a confidence in one's ability to please God by the keeping of the law without the proper inner disposition or spiritual foundation. Both Beth Yeshua and other Alliance congregations seek to avoid legalism by keeping the issue of ritual observance one of individual choice. For instance, Rob Kirsch of Beth Yeshua explains his wearing of the seat seat, the ritual fringes, as something God had laid on my heart, but did not compel him to insist others wear it. For each person has the spirit and works things out on his own. It's not my place to tell them how to ritually behave or act. Of the UMJC, she says, In general, however, the UMJC stresses the inherent duty of Messianic Jews to keep Jewish traditions which ones are debatable because they are a part of God's special calling for Jews as a whole. Traditions, including circumcision, the Sabbath, keeping kosher, or observing the holidays, are matters of obedience to God, not personal preference or conscience. In a recent discussion at the 2002 Lausanne Consultation on Jewish Evangelism Conference on Messianic Jewish Identity, a UMJC-affiliated rabbi argued that Messianic Jews who do not keep kosher are in sin against God, denying their calling and identity. Kinzer and Eaton have voiced similar views. One of the implications of this stance is that observance of the traditions becomes a measure of spirituality and closeness with God, creating a spiritual hierarchy between those who are most observant relative to those who are less so. By keeping the law, union congregations also hope to build bridges with observant parts of the Jewish community. According to Stuart Dowerman, a rabbi affiliated with the UMJC and founder of Hashivenu, if communications are ever to improve, we must maintain every possible shred of commonality with the wider Jewish community. Reason also stated that the UMJC's approach toward reaching other Jews is fundamentally different from that of the Alliance. The Alliance's ties to evangelicalism, including its saved versus unsaved dichotomy, create a strong impetus for Jewish evangelism. By contrast, leaders within the UMJC are beginning to disassociate from the primacy and means of evangelism as traditionally understood. Reason's article received a response from Daniel Juster describing a movement and universal truth in which he affirms some of Reason's article but also takes issue with some of it. An insight we can gain from Juster's article is his explanation of how Messianic Judaism aligns with evangelicalism as opposed to Catholicism, Orthodoxy, or mainline Protestantism, for example. He says, while some Messianic Jewish leaders would like to distance themselves from evangelicalism, too many doctrines are held in common for this to be credible. The author indicates as much by noting the doctrinal agreement on these points by the MJAA and UMJC. For example, let's note these teachings that are agreed upon in Messianic Judaism. Yeshua is the Messiah. He rose from the dead. He is fully deity, and in his deity pre-existed the creation. He has given honor like unto the Father, John 5. He is called the Alpha and Omega. He died for our sins and provides our atonement. When we embrace the offer of salvation in Yeshua, kingdom of God, an inner transformation takes place that is called the new birth. Are these affirmations important in the Messianic Judaism of the UMJC? The commission surveys prove that these affirmations were overwhelmingly important to the great majority of members in the UMJC. In addition, strong statements on the Messiah's person, including his full humanity and deity, were approved by the delegates this summer. Also, a statement on salvation being procured only by his death and resurrection was also affirmed. The UMJC also affirms its spiritual unity with all true followers of Yeshua in the Christian world in the UMJC statement defining Messianic Judaism. Where in the whole Christian world would one find this combination of affirmations and also just those things that are not affirmed 
apostolic succession, the place of Mary, prayer to the saints, the efficacy of sacraments. One finds such affirmations, as well as the lack of other affirmations, only within the broad world phenomenon known as evangelicalism. This is even more apparent to me in the intensive dialogues which I have with Roman Catholic, Anglican, and Orthodox Christian leaders. I am not arguing here that we should be so within the confession of evangelicals, but that we are. The very doctrinal statement of the UMJC bears this out. Both IAMCS and the UMJC use the word immerse to refer to baptism, which shows that the mode they practice is, in fact, immersion. Messianic Judaism, in contrast to some Christians, does view the modern nation of Israel as fulfillment of biblical prophecy. For example, IAMCS says, We believe in God's end-time plan for the nation of Israel and for the world. A central part of Messianic Judaism is the belief in the physical and spiritual restoration of Israel as taught in the scriptures. The greatest miracle of our day has been the reestablishment or rebirth of the state of Israel according to prophecy. They teach salvation is by grace through faith and that good works cannot save. IAMCS says, We believe that salvation has always been by faith and that works of law or righteous acts have never saved anyone. An interesting controversy within Messianic Judaism is the question of accepting non-Jews, Gentiles, into the community. Nearly all groups will allow this to some extent. A person who is not raised as a Jew discovers a Messianic synagogue and decides to be a part. This is normally permitted. But the question becomes, do they need to do anything? Should they follow the same observances as everyone else? Rabbi Dr. Richard C. Nichols spends 41 pages covering this issue in the article, The Case for Conversion, Welcoming Non-Jews into Messianic Jewish Space, in which he says that there should be a conversion process for a Christian who wants to become a Messianic Jew. Part of the article says, First, conversion done properly should become an option in our synagogues for those non-Jews who, by the demonstration of a pattern of life and a passion of soul, indicate to us that they would like to be fully joined to the Jewish people. They should be able to do so after a period of formal preparation, appearance before a Din, which has the authority to investigate the applicant's level of commitment and understanding, a mikvah, and a joyful welcoming among the community. Second, our trajectory should include disallowing those few practices which are emblematic of Jewish covenant obligation to non-Jews who do not wish to convert. These would include things like wearing of the tallit, coming up to the bima to read Torah, becoming bar mitzvah, serving as rabbis and cantors. Controversial Messianic Jewish rabbi Lauren Jacobs strongly disagrees with the conversion concept. He says, what's wrong with conversion? It is a repetition of one of the first major errors in the early Messianic movement, the error of the Judaizers, pressuring Gentile Christians to be circumcised and become Jews and live like Jews and take on all the unique responsibilities given to the chosen people under the Sinai Covenant. The First Jerusalem Council met and ruled on this issue, see Acts 15, and according to its Holy Spirit-inspired decision, Gentile Christians don't need to be circumcised or live a Sinai Covenant-based life. Paul's letter to Messiah's communities in Galatia, most likely written before the First Jerusalem Council strongly reinforces this truth. As for the role of women in the synagogues of Messianic Judaism, Rachel Wolf writes in Introduction to Messianic Judaism, Today, many Messianic synagogues have an egalitarian policy when it comes to liturgical prayer and worship. So many women serve as cantors, Torah readers, and in other traditionally male roles. In Israeli Messianic Jewish congregations, views range from women taking absolutely no administrative or teaching responsibilities except for teaching women and children, to full administrative and teaching preaching responsibilities. Some women teach the Torah portion and also preach and teach the main sermon. Wolf also states, as Messianic Jewish women look for direction in the Hebrew scriptures, in the apostolic writings, in Jewish and Christian tradition, each through the lens of their own experience, it is easy to find many contradictory messages. Thus, there are a variety of opinions on the question of women's roles, and there is no recognized Messianic Jewish standard. Joel Willits provides some orderly observations about Messianic Judaism in the conclusion of An Introduction to Messianic Judaism. First, about the movement itself. Messianic Judaism is historically both ancient and modern. Messianic Judaism is a multilingual, worldwide movement of Messianic Jews and Messianic Gentiles who have come alongside them. Messianic Judaism is a diverse movement theologically, culturally, halakhically, and ecclesially. Messianic Judaism is a growing movement that remains very much in process. Messianic Judaism is in the midst of an intense period of identity formation. 
Messianic Judaism is developing young leaders who are theologically and biblically trained at the highest levels, ensuring a strong future. Messianic Judaism is experiencing positive development in its relationship with the wider Jewish and Christian worlds. Secondly, Willis provides four key theological takeaways. God's covenant relationship with the Jewish people, Israel, is present and future. Israel has a distinctive role and priority in God's redemptive activity through Messiah Jesus. By God's design and calling, there is a continuing distinction between Jew and Gentile in the church today. For Jews, distinction takes shape fundamentally through Torah observance as an expression of covenant faithfulness to the God of Israel and the Messiah Jesus. Most Christians have heard of Messianic Judaism, but very few today understand it fully, especially the implications that its theology has on Christianity and Judaism alike. Although over 500 synagogues is an amazing achievement, it's still very small compared both to Christianity and Judaism as a whole. Thanks for watching this Ready to Harvest video. Visit readytoharvest.com to support the production of more informative videos like this one.